Now, Bill Haney is an interesting man in and of himself. He was born at the intersection of Big Beaver and Rochester Road, actually one block off the intersection. Um, he was president of his class at Troy High School. I didn't know And that. he went to college. He had a BA in English on scholarship. And then he, I'm always conflicted to tell you what Bill did for a living because he did everything. Um, he's been, a, as he said, a writer since he could hold a crayon. And his first gig as a writer was a stringer with the Royal Oak Tribune at the age of 15. I learned on our way to dinner tonight, he was precocious. He drove all the way to California and back with his family at the age of 15. He was the only driver, <laughs> but he didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of what Bill was like. True. He's had careers in aerospace build business, scholarly book publishing, advertising public relations. He was uh, on the faculty at U of M for 11 years. He was associate and managing editor of University of Michigan Press. He's owned his own publishing company. He's contributed or authored or ghostwritten over 500 titles, or 400 titles. 400. I learned more about baseball, Thai food, and um, golf balls over dinner tonight. <laughs> Any man, I always learn something new from him. But, and, and who Bill knows? Whether it's Ernie Harwell and Tom Monahan or the president of this group or Tom Brokaw, Bill has met them, talked to them, broken bread with them. But what I like about Bill best is he has his feet firmly planted in the ground and he loves history from the bottom up. And he's never lost a connection with his home community, that little corner at Rochester Road and Big Beaver, even though he ended up all the way in the Big Apple. So tonight, I would like you to welcome one of our own people who recognizes that we all, in our own community, are part of history. Would you please welcome Mr. Bill Haney? Well, Let's see if this works. How's that? Okay. Thank you, Rainey, for those generous remarks. I can hardly wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> and I want to thank Rainey, though, to begin with for doing this program and uh, also the staff of the uh, Troy Historical Museum uh, who have done a wonderful job and have helped me uh, not only on this book as fact checkers and sources of information um, but in many other ways on some other books that we did together. And I want to thank all of you for coming out here tonight, some familiar faces and some that I haven't seen in a good number of decades but delighted to see again. I'm especially looking forward to, after I get done talking, and I'm not going to talk forever, honest, um, of hearing any comments or questions that, that you may have. And uh, some of you may have been around these parts. I know some of you have. Uh, some of my good friends from the class of 54 are right here. But I wonder how many lived in or around Troy, um, say, even as recently as the 90s. Uh, I would imagine quite a few. Yeah? Okay, about, how about since the 80s? A little, yeah, still a lot. Let's go back to the 70s. Good Lord. Yeah. Okay, 50s. Wow. I'm in trouble here because... <laughs> As Rainey was saying, uh, some of these stories are written from the ground up, and you people were standing in this ground uh, at the same time I was. So I hope my, uh, my memory is uh, at least uh, somewhat close to yours about some of these things. Every time I come back to Troy, I learn something new. Uh, and uh, I think perhaps tonight uh, will be an occasion like that, because we've got a number of folks who who uh, also have their, have their origins here, or at least have been here for a good, good number of years. 
Before I get too much further, though, I want to mention a couple of other, in fact, there are several authors, really, in the, in the house that I know. Rainey Campbell herself has written a beautiful book called uh, A Pocket Full of Passage, which is really delightful. We have, my family, bought a number of them for other friends, and they all love it. And I think you would, too. It's about the adventures of a young girl uh, back uh, in uh, the Lighthouse days at Michigan, and it's a charming book. And my friend Karen Wilhelm is here. Karen, why don't you raise your hand at least or stand up, yeah. Karen has written a beautiful book called uh, In Sunlight or in Shadow uh, about the interesting adventures of uh, a character down in, in Ferndale, which you're going to hear a lot more about because he's got another extravaganza launching at 5 p.m. on March 20th called The Assembly Line. And I think he has like 200 bands or musical groups lined up to perform for 240 hours. Is that right? Incredible. Um, so anyhow, and Pete, perhaps, you know, Pete is an author of a book. He's author of a number of things that... Uh, uh, textbook. Yeah. Textbook. Well, there you go. So anybody that's in the market for a good textbook, Dr. Peter Eckstein here, my co it's good... better in Chinese than the good name. The Chinese, I heard raves about that. Yeah. <laughs> And I, there's, a, I'm sure, a major motion picture opening soon. <laughs> so Pete and I were, um, were colleagues on the uh, University of Mi Michigan's student newspaper called the Michigan Daily, which was a fine newspaper. Still is. Yes. At the same time that next door to Peter there, David Kessel was holding forth in the, on our humor magazine, The Gargoyle, appropriately named. So anyhow, I'm sure I've missed some others. but. Delighted to be here, and uh, perhaps some of you have wondered about a question that when I was a kid growing up here in the 40s uh, was a frequently asked question in the, in the area, um, and we'll get to that, but uh, the, the, the area has changed a lot. It's grown, it's grown up and it's grown out uh, in the six decades since really uh, this was just a collection of villages and hamlets and elementary schools and two class D schools. And I know that some of you know what the names of those two schools were. One of them was Big Beaver. What was the other one? Log Cabin. Log Cabin, yeah, which was at Livernoy uh, north of uh, 15 Mile, Maple Road, on the west side. But uh, then those hamlets and schools uh, coalesced along with a few other wide places in the road and became, took on a new identity called Troy. And I was one of the 99 members of the first class to go through four years of Troy High School. The big new school near the northwest corner of Big Beaver and Livernoy hadn't been finished in time for the 50-51 school year. So instead, we spent our first year at uh, Big Beaver School, which was a short block to the northeast of Big Beaver Corners, Rochester Road and Big Beaver Road. And that meant I had to walk, uh, I had a walk of less than 60 steps uh, from home to school. No excuse for being tardy. But I also had to always go home for lunch. I never got to have one of those fancy metal lunch pails with a matching thermos bottle. <laughs> and I didn't even get to have a, a brown paper bag. I envied the kids who did. I, I had to go home for my uh, grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup, which the other kids, after eating their bologna sandwiches for a few weeks, thought was really something to go home for a hot meal. And nothing against my mother's cooking, but I really lusted after one of those metal Metal lunch pail. Never had a lunch pail. But neither Big Beaver nor Log Cabin High, which were the two Class D precursors of Troy, had a gym. I remember when we, we had one major upgrade there. We had Mike Rankin, who was the janitor, put up a basketball hoop, bolted it into the brick wall on the back of Big Beaver School. And we thought that was really terrific, but it was not really the best setup for driving layups. I remember that, but we were glad to have it. 
Um, because the schools had meager resources and facilities, the move into that new high school brought immense change. We felt that overnight we had gone from, from poverty hollow to the penthouse. So when the 50-51 school year began, we had our very own gym. And before long, we had a football field right behind the school. That was heady stuff. And we weren't going to waste any opportunities. We could now throw ourselves into activities which as kids in grade school and junior high, we never really expected to have. So perhaps it was no surprise that there were large turnouts for extracurricular activities. And my three colleagues here from class, uh, class of 54 can attest to that. Uh, we didn't waste anything. We, we got into everything. I, I played five sports my freshman year. I couldn't make a, a, a single team, I'm sure, years later. But I played football, baseball, basketball, track, and golf. <laughs> and uh, with varying amounts of success. <laughs> but we, uh, we did become the first. And, and I remember we had a, a group of us that chipped in $5 a piece, which was a lot of money then to go down to Oak Ridge. Anybody know where Oak Ridge is? There's an Oak Ridge person. 13 Mile in Rochester Road, there was a school called Oak Ridge. And we'd go down there so we could play basketball when we were in junior high because we didn't have anything but that one hoop on the back of the wall out there. And uh, we played in a Royal Oak Recreation League. And I, we played a team called, very appropriately named, called the Wicked Five. The Wicked Five. And these guys were terrific all-state players who went to Wayne and U of D and then flunked out and then wanted to play ball, so they joined this thing. And I will tell you this. I was, for our team, the high point man in that game. I made a technical foul shot. <laughs> they called a technical on the other team for laughing. <laughs> We, it was, we were in it right up, right up to the opening tip-off. We were in that game. And we got beat 135 to 1. But as a measure of how we grew, that was the first time we played that team. By the time we played them at the end of the year, we held them to 110 to 8. We were one proud bunch of kids. So that was in the eighth grade. By the time we got to high school and actually got in our own gymnasium, we were not about to waste any opportunities. And uh, that year, we were undefeated, the first championship for Troy. Uh, and not the last, we won the All Sports Trophy. And our girls' teams were just as good. And we finished uh, in the uh, top in speech and choir and other things and won the state championship in debate. So it was a good thing. I think we all appreciated the fact that we didn't have a damn thing, frankly, when we started out and when we grew up. That's what Troy was like. That's what Big Beaver was like in the 40s and the early 50s, at least where I lived. And um, in a blink of an eye, though, it seemed like it was all over with. Uh, school went so fast. And then we were gone. We were gone to college, we were gone to jobs in other cities and states, some were gone into the service. But as Rainey mentioned, some of us never really severed the umbilical. We kept coming back, we remained tied or to Troy, Big Beaver area, at least in touch, uh, one way or another, no matter where fortune took us. And whenever we returned, no matter how long or short the time that we were gone, we'd see that Troy had changed. It had grown up, and it had grown out, and it had grown the way that the visionaries of more than half a century ago had foreseen when they came up with the motto. And you know the motto of Troy? Those of you who haven't lived in Troy, like Peter lives in Ann Arbor? Incredible motto. Do you know our motto? What's our motto? The city of tomorrow today. The city of, yes, and that's exactly was my reaction. <laughs> we couldn't believe it, that here we were, and they were going to say, this city of tomorrow today, here we were, the tough blue-collar kids 
of Big Beaver and Log Cabin. And the thing that we were known for most in Oakland County was how loud our and fast our hot rods were mm -hmm. that we uh, raced, drag raced up and down on Woodward. And some of those jalopies were legends all the way from the totem pole to Ted's trailer. So what a pipe dream it was then that Troy would ever be as big as, say, Clawson, <laughs> or let alone Rochester. You remember Rochester? Rochester had, you remember the name of the theater in Rochester? What it was called? Right down from Red Knapps? The Hills. The Hills. And when you could go to the Maine or the Royal Oak or the Washington, for kids were dying uh, then, at least that's what I paid. And you'd go to Kraske's and get that big long tube of uh, popcorn and a bunch of candy and go in there and see a double or triple feature and a newsreel and previews of the coming attractions and the cereal and spend about five hours there for a dime. No cartoons? No oh, cartoons, of course. Thank you, Peter. That's why we bring Peters for the cartoons. Yeah. But that was a big deal, and in, and in those days, uh, the Hills Theater in Rochester, when everything else was a dime or a quarter, it was a half a dollar. <laughs> yeah, that was, but it had uh, those velvet ropes, you know, and chrome and stuff. Man, you go there and you, you talk about that for a week. Yeah, I went to the I went to Hills Theater. What'd you see? I don't know. I just went to the theater. <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, it hadn't been really uh, all that long before our high school was built, that the most exciting talk in town was about the hanging of the traffic light at the intersection of Big Beaver and Rochester Roads. That was big time. I remember I was a safety patrol boy at that intersection, and I'd stand there, and I had my badge. You'd have this belt, and it went across like this, and then if you became lieutenant, you had a blue badge. No, I guess it was red. Yeah, lieutenant was red and the captain was blue. Then you'd know you'd arrived, you know? <laughs> I'm the captain. I'm the captain. And I'd just look at that light changing in colors. It'd be red, it'd be amber, it'd be green, you know? I'd just stare at that light thinking, boy, is technology grand. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than this. But one thing has not changed over time in Troy. And that's the mystery and sometimes the controversy about the origin of the name Big Beaver. Now, I know there are any number of supposedly authoritative versions from which people can take their pick. And then they defend it as though that's the verified gospel. And that's as true today, as in my experience, when I ask people about that and they come up with a story, which is always interesting, and they insist that it's true. The story of how the name Big Beaver came about is perhaps forever lost in the mists of time. But then again, maybe not. This is from chapter one of, what is the title of this book? Oh, From Big Beaver to the Big Apple. And that's a big beaver, and what, what do you think he's holding right there? Huh? The Big Apple. And, uh, this, type, this chapter is called Turnip Watches. Oh, by the way, I was going to put this out here so I knew when to shut up. This was the turnip watch uh, that my dad got. In fact, I think I refer to that in this little thing I'm going to read. In the 1930s, there were few good options for the driver of a car low on fuel and northbound into the rural reaches of Oakland County. Once the motorist passed Royal Oak, Gasoline service stations were rare along Rochester Road. On a, sum, on a summer day, many of the cars fleeing the hot urban streets were headed for the country's lakes or for the saltwater swimming pool. Familiar? The sign said, saltier than the Great Salt Lake. At Rochester, at uh, Long, just north of Long Lake Road. Not on the northwest corner, but not far from there. In those days, the finicky fuel gauges running low on gas was not uncommon, and running out was something to be avoided in that sparsely populated countryside. At 14 Mile Road, the driver could detour west a mile to Livernoy Road, 
and on a lucky day could get $10 for the gallon of Jake Levi's Oakland's Finest Fuel. Anybody remember that? Hey, yeah. Yeah, right. If you were really, really lucky and hit Jake's on his silver dollar day, that was a promotion that must have cost Jake a small fortune. You would get a genuine silver dollar for a fill-up. But if the driver took his chances and stayed on Rochester Road, his only choice was True Blue Sunoco. That was at the little station just north of the corner of Big Beaver and Rochester Roads under the sign proclaiming Haney's Oil Well. <laughs> Hearing the crunch of tires in the gravel, Raymond or Red Haney or one of his sons, those are my three older brothers, would pull himself out from under a car on the shop floor. He'd wipe the grease off his hands and ask how many. And then Red would start up the pump that would fill that gravity flow gas tank, or the glass tank, rather, that was perched up high on the structure. And that way the motorist could see that he was indeed getting the full measure for his money. That is, if he had money. <laughs> Not infrequently, the driver would fumble in his pockets, mumble something about having left his wallet to home, and he'd offer up his pocket watch, People's Exhibit A. He'd promise to be back in a few days with his cash to proclaim that priceless Elgin or that West Clock's pocket bend. He'd ask Red Haney to keep that silver-plated Illinois flip-top in a safe place because that timepiece was a gift from Granddad. It was the very watch he carried when he was a conductor on the railway. That watch has sentimental value, the out-of-cash motorist would say. Take good care of it until I get back next week. So into the R.G. Dunn bouquet cigar box, the turnip watch would go, where it had plenty of company, <laughs> even a few that kept time. <laughs> Once in a while, the driver did come back for the irreplaceable family heirloom. Then out of gratitude for having been extended credit by a stranger, the motorist might buy a handful of cigars, or he'd order up a grease job and an oil change. He might stand around a while asking questions while the ruddy-faced Irishman serviced his car. If the fellow were a fisherman, he'd want to know which of those 500-odd lakes out there in North Oakland County held the biggest pike, the most bluegill, the liveliest bass. He might ask if it was true you could get a nice chunk of land in Troy Township for $50 the acre on a land contract. And sooner or later would come the most common query. How did this place come by the name Big Beaver? That would bring a twinkle to Red Haney's eyes. And he'd light up an old gold and he'd launch once again into his yarn about how the village and the road got its name. It was easy for him to tell the story convincingly. He had spun it so many times he'd come to believe it himself. <laughs> now that would have been back about 1850 he'd begin looking off to the distance as if to retrieve the facts from somewhere out there in space. Yes, sir, they say he was the bravest of all, chief of the very last band of Indians in these parts. Oh, they'd been treated shabbily, all right, lied to, cheated by one fork-tongued white man after the next, pushed out of Detroit on the promise they'd have all the land of North Oakland County in perpetuity. Then he would stop and give the listener a sharp look. Perpetuity. Now that's a mighty long time. But not so long to a city slicker as to a Potawatomi, or especially to an Ottawa, an Ottawa Indian chief like the great Big Beaver. Wouldn't you know it, in a few years the white man's government is after him again, telling him once more to pack up and move out further north. Better yet, head west. Lots of space up there in Minnesota. So they say. That's just what Michigan's other Indian tribes had done when they got the ultimatum. So you can imagine the reaction when Chief Big Beaver says, no. No, this is our sacred land. It's our ancestral land. And here is where we stand or die. Now that kind of talk was music to the ears of the US government. Before long, the fighting was fierce. From the very spot where you're standing right now, on up to the Clinton River in Rochester. 
There was such a battle, just a couple hundred yards up Rochester Road there, on the banks of our little stream, they, that they say that for miles downstream the water ran red with blood, Indian and white man alike. That country club south near 12 Mile, the one they call Red Run, <laughs> well, it said that's where it got its name. Red Run from all the blood that bled on both sides. But you asked about Big Beaver, and I'm coming to that. Well, Chief Big Beaver himself took some lead, enough to cost him the use of his left arm, but he never went down. No, he rallied his few surviving braves and gathered up the squaws and the young ones. Silent as ghosts, they slipped into the woods. Moving in the dark of night, they made it to the shore of Orchard Lake. <laughs> There they found the canoes they had hidden just for this eventuality and paddled themselves over to the island. That's the island that now some call Apple Island. Apple island. But the old timers know it to this day as Chief Big Beaver's Island. That chief was a smart one and his band had already stashed food and provisions there knowing it would one day come to this. Well, they held out all through that summer and the fall. Every time the government would mount an attack, that brave band of Indians would drive the white man's boats away with a hail of arrows. And as fierce a fighters as they were, they'd be there to this day except for one thing. Here he would pause and wait for the inevitable question. You know what that question is? What, 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 what would that one thing be? Ice. Ice, he would answer. That's what did the men. Plain old count on it every Michigan winter, ice. Come late December, they'd wake up one day and there's a sheet of ice all the way from the east shore of Orchard Lake right up to Chief Big Beaver's Island. By January, that ice is thick enough that the military could bring all their mighty armament to bear. I'll spare you the gory details. But I can tell you that Chief Big Beaver was true to his word. Weakened though he was from his old wounds, he fought that overwhelming army to the bitter end. Finally, it came down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with that old chief flailing away with his one good arm. Red Haney would light up a fresh cigarette off the butt of the old one and let it sink in. Yes, that was the last stand of the bravest Indian of them all, Chief Big Beaver. Then he would pause and shake his head. Don't know about you, but I'd say that Indian was worthy of having this place named after him. Well, by the 1950s, Red Haney's legend of the mighty Chief Big Beaver was told, retold, and passed along with authenticating embellishments so often that none questioned its validity. Certainly not me. I told it to my cousins in Summit, New Jersey, in Pickway, Ohio, in Crescent City, Florida. I told it to anyone anywhere who asked how that little village in Troy Township, Michigan got such a name. I told it countless times and every time I did I had no doubt I was recounting genuine 24 karat gold nugget of history, even allowing for my father's tendency to improve more than a little on the facts. Then one day in 1955, as a student at the University of Michigan, I went to the Natural Sciences Museum. Remember that, Pete? Natural Science oh, Museum. Yeah. David, you know that place, the Natural Science Museum. It was a class assignment to learn about the specimens we would be asked about in an upcoming zoology exam. At one display, I stopped for a better look at a fossil skull. At first glance, I presumed it to be that of a bear, the kind of specimen one might be asked to identify in that exam. So I looked more closely at specimen number UM3110. Strange, those teeth were certainly not typical of a carnivore and most definitely not a bear. They looked to be the teeth of an animal would use to gnaw wood. They looked almost like, like the teeth of a beaver, a really, really Big beaver. <laughs> then I read the placard beside the skull and my face reddened. It flushed for all those times I had parroted Red Haney's epic tale of the noble chief Big Beaver. 
But perhaps this was merely a coincidence. Yes, there must be an explanation. I went to the museum curator's office, and when I learned that the skull on display had been found in, in Ann Arbor, I breathed easier, but only for a moment. Then the curator told me that the Ann Arbor skull was on display only because it was better preserved than the first one found in southeastern Michigan. That one, much larger, had been uncovered elsewhere in the state. The curator riffled through a file and produced a card, nodding as he read the notes. It seems that a road construction crew unearthed it while excavating a foundation for a road in Troy Township. It was in the vicinity of Waddles Road between Livernoy and Rochester Roads, half a mile to the east of her. In other words, the original Big Beaver skeleton was found in the very heart of the village that soon after became known as Big Beaver. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. One thing about being a writer, and eventually uh, you get a dim understanding of things that most normal people have known for a long time. Maybe it's the act of putting those words down on paper that finally enables you to see more clearly something that is so obviously true. And one good thing about being a slow learner, or having a bad memory for that matter, is that you get to experience the thrill of discovery, the light bulb flashes that go on and off, uh, go on off over your forehead again and again. It's kind of a kind of em endless replay, so that same eureka moment. You keep rediscovering these things. But it is more than just understanding and recalling some facts. What I'm talking about is a dawning ability to make connections. Connections between events that happened many years ago and to draw lessons or extract insights about similar events occurring in the present. Or the other way around, to have a current event shed light on an experience you had as a child. Many times in recent years something has happened that has illuminated an incident that baffled me as a youngster or as a teenager. And um, a few years ago I was um, I was wandering around in about a, oh, a half a world away from here, in a little country called New Zealand. And a memory was triggered then of something that had happened here many, many years ago. I was on a gravel road on the outside, uh, on the outskirts of a tiny, tiny town, much smaller than Big Beaver ever was, 135 people. And most of them are uh, people there to take you out on treks to see the elusive kiwi bird, or to run a little fishing boat and catch cod with handheld lines with using blue, was it green lip mussels, uh, in a little island called Stewart Island, New Zealand. And I was carrying a, a bag of rented golf clubs, and I was heading for Ringa Ringa Golf Course. It's a six-hole golf course of which there are not very many in the world. <laughs> and this, this was the southernmost golf course in the world. And it just seemed uh, a shame to go all the way down to the southern tip of New Zealand to the southernmost golf course in the world and not play it. So I rented a, a little bag of clubs and I was off to, to play this golf course. And uh, I got directions from the man in the there was no pro shop. The course was out way out in the middle of nowhere, and you bought, bought your ticket, pardon me, <coughs> and rented the clubs, and then walked out to the, to the course. And he gave me these directions. And the directions were spot on, as I had learned to say since landing in Auckland two weeks earlier, which was many hundreds of miles of winding mountain roads and two ferry boats rides to the north. And just as advertised, there were the cows a dozen or so, healthy, black and white milkers. And there was the footpath he had told me about. I climbed through the hole in the fence, 
taking care to replace the burlap flap he would told me to put back and uh, cover up the hole so the cows wouldn't get out. And as I turned to the golf course, I stopped. I was aware, I felt I was being watched. And there she was, the boldest, or perhaps only the most curious cow, fixing me in her, gla in her gaze as she ambled toward me. Still chewing her cud and flicking her tail against her black and white flank, she stared steadily at me. Her bulging black eyes shone as she fixed me in her gaze. It seemed as if she was daring me to retrieve some distant memory. And I did. I remember the last time I saw that look. It was more than 40 years earlier. And then only for the briefest of instants. It was at dusk on a gravel road in Big Beaver. The night that I helped Lawrence Smith demolish his father's brand new Buick. <laughs> Sparsely populated though Big Beaver was, there were several Smith families in the area that were unrelated to each other. Unless you want to trace back to Adam and Eve, our math teacher Rudolf Smith once said to me. But certainly the most prominent of the local Smiths was Wesley. Anybody here remember Wesley Smith? Yeah, you would. Yeah. He was the proprietor of Beaver Feed Company and what passed for downtown Big Beaver. That store stood on the east side of Rochester Road, just a few hundred feet south of Big Beaver Road's intersection. And above it, above which, as I mentioned earlier, hung the first uh, traffic light in the vicinity. But the heavy business part of Smith's operation, the shellers, the mixers, the grinders, the sorters, loading docks, and the scales, they were in the back, out of view. The feed store's prominent sign mounted above the front door proclaimed that this is your place for feed, quotes, bubbling over with vitamins for poultry, dogs, and all living creatures. <laughs> Even before rationing imposed by the war, many frugal families in Troy Township raised chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, rabbits, pigs, and other critters for their own dinner tables. That provided brisk business for the feed and grain suppliers of Oakland County. There was no doubt who was the boss at Beaver Feed. Wes Smith presided over the business with a firm and steady hand that neighborhood kids feared might well be applied to their backsides if they got too frisky or light-fingered around his establishment. I was one of the pals of Wes's son, Lawrence, and once in a while would go on delivery runs with him. Lawrence had been driving truck for years, even though he was only 14 and not yet eligible for a driver's license. I think Lawrence might have been my inspiration for that, that trip to California when I was 15 and didn't have a license. But I think a lot of kids then drove without a license, you know. Uh, and some of us lived through it. <laughs> Late one afternoon, Lawrence somehow talked his father into letting him take me and some of the guys out for an evening spin in Wes's brand new 1950 Buick. That four-door Roadmaster sedan was one of the sharpest cars in all of Big Beaver. Right up there were the Lincolns, driven by Superintendent Stuart K. Baker and Janitor Mike Rankin. Now, they both had 1948 Lincoln Cosmopolitans. Mike Rankin, the janitor, got his first. <laughs> that was something. The janitor of Big Beaver School and the superintendent both drove the same vehicle. From headlight to rear bumper, you could see your face reflected in that Buick's mirror-like dark blue finish and its massive polished chrome bumpers and grill. In a town populated with rusting pickup trucks and clunky old sedans, West Smith's Buick was a gem. Haney, I'm letting you, I'm letting Lawrence take you boys out for a little spin in that car, but only if you tell me he can be trusted to be careful, West Smith said to me in that deep growl that could be mis not be mistaken in its severity. Now, you're giving me your word on that, are you? Yes, sir, Mr. Smith. Lawrence is a real good driver. You bet he's careful, all right. So off we went, gliding northward on Rochester Road, slowing as we passed Saltwater Pool and seeing not much going on there. The sun was going down as we cruised past Sylvan Glen Golf Course, where I still tramped the roughs and waded the creeks in search of lost balls. 
We continued all the way to Avon Road, and there we turned west. We stopped short of heading down Rochester Hill, not venturing into town lest we draw the attention of local police. It was a delicious experience riding in that Buick, sitting there in the front seat, watching the world opening up beyond that panoramic windshield. It was like lounging on your best parlor sofa. If you had a parlor and a sofa, which we didn't, but I was sure that it, that was what it must be like. West Smith's plush Buick still had a hint of that intoxicating new car smell, like I remembered from Mike Rankin's Lincoln Cosmopolitan, Grandma Hudson's, Grandma Campbell's Hudson. That was Freddie Campbell's uh, grandma. That's another story. In fact, that story's in here too. We wrecked that car too. Now we were southbound on Livernois and headed home. The sun began to set as Lawrence turned east onto Waddles Road. Then he goosed it and churned up a plume of dust behind us on the gravel road. Lawrence, look, I said. See that up ahead? There's somebody standing in the road. Haney, you need new glasses, he said. That's a cow. We were closing fast. Lawrence was right. It was a great big black and white spotted dairy cow standing right in the middle of Merrill Waddles Road, her ample rump toward us. <laughs> when we got to within 100 yards or so, she turned her head and looked at us. For sure, Lawrence will slow down, I thought, or maybe blow the horn to scare her away. No room to get around her on either side and stay on the road. Instead, he speeded up, even faster. As we were within a few yards of the cow, she bolted to the, to the left barely clearing the way for the onrushing Buick to pass on the right. Then for whatever reason or for no reason at all, the cow jumped back to the right, right smack in front of the car. Good thing Lawrence had quick reflexes. He instantly swerved and just in time too, for our left front fender missed the cow by a couple of feet as we sped past. But now the right wheels had dropped down into the roadside ditch and it felt like we were still going 50 miles an hour, but not for long. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling Ward and uh, Rainey as we drove over for dinner tonight, and I pointed to the spot where this happened. There were a few homes along the south side of Waddles Road between Livernoy and Rochester Roads, but right in front of us was a driveway with a metal tube culvert, culvert set in it to handle runoff water from the ditch. When we smashed into the bank of that culvert, the Buick seemed to fly in 10 directions, and so did the bodies within it. <laughs> Everything was si in silent, slow motion as we were airborne for what seemed like a very long time. We landed, not exactly right side up, with an enormous explosion of sound. Then silence. A few seconds passed. Somebody swore. <laughs> Somebody asked if everyone was okay. Somebody else said, how the hell do we get out of here? <laughs> it seemed as though there were more people in the front seat than there had been a moment ago. <laughs> Bob Hayward mumbled something and I saw that he had his hand over his mouth and a trickle of blood ran through his fingers. The back of my head felt wet and when I touched it, I could tell why Bob's mouth was bleeding. He had smashed his face against the back of my head, impaling his two front teeth against my skull. <laughs> Other than those little necks, we had been stunned, shaken up, and tossed about, but no one was seriously hurt. We crawled out of the Buick and stood there in the gravel road, not wanting to look closely at the car, pitched as it was on a grotesque angle in the ditch. I heard a low moan and wondered if it was Bob mourning for his teeth. Then I heard it again and realized it was the cow. <laughs> Standing on the other side of the road, chewing her cud as if this sort of business happened every day. <laughs> she stared at me for a long moment, then loped off into the gathering darkness. Listen, somebody said, what's that sound? It was not a healthy sound that hiss coming from the radiator. Now we could see a pale cloud wafting from the upturned hood into the cool evening air. 
Hey, the left side of the car doesn't look too bad, I said, as we surveyed this scene. It was true. There didn't seem to be a mark on it. Yeah, maybe we could all push this, push together and get the Buick up and out of the ditch and we could wipe it off and get it safely back to beaver feed with Mr. Smith never the wiser. <laughs> Our spirits brightening, we went down into the ditch to where we could examine the car's front and the right side. Wow, somebody said. I looked at the smashed grill, crumpled fenders and wrinkled hood. It was not a pretty sight. Oh my God, Lawrence said, my dad's gonna kill me. Fifteen minutes later, Wes Smith arrived at the scene. After looking at his battered Buick, West found me where I was off to the side trying to shrink into the weeds. <laughs> he loomed over me. I had always known that Mr. Smith was a large man, but until that moment I didn't realize he was 14 feet tall and weighed 500 pounds. <laughs> Perhaps he spoke only in normal tones, but his words echoed down upon my head like the bellowing thunder of the gods. So I can trust his driving, Haney. I have your word on it, do I? I started to explain that Lawrence was really a good driver. Look at the great job he did avoiding that dumb cow and... But Mr. Wesley Smith didn't seem particularly interested in hearing my explanation. I guess he had his own reasons. <laughs> so, those are the lives and times of some of us miscreants in uh, Big Beaver back in the 40s and 50s, and I am sure that there are many more stories like that uh, represented in these church pews tonight. So if people have questions or comments or stories of their own that they want to share, I'd be delighted. And if they're real good, you might see them in print someday with my name on them. <laughs> any questions, any thoughts, any corrections of my, uh, my memory? Peter? Life in the pizza business. Oh gosh. I've, I've heard at least two different versions of it. Both there are more. <laughs> and uh, the other people haven't heard it, I'm sure either version would be uh, interesting. Well, actually, Peter, that's one that is in this book. Uh, and I was telling again, well, we must have had a long dinner because we told a lot of stories, didn't we, Randy? <laughs> Lord. That uh, I guess Tom Monahan's name came up. <laughs> And uh, Tom, long before he became famous for the things that he's currently famous for and owned the Tigers and, uh, and uh, uh, Domino's Pizza, was in a little pizza business in Ypsilanti uh, about the same time, actually a little bit later, than I was in a pizza business in uh, Ann Arbor, when Peter and I were, and David there, were in college together in the mid-50s. And uh, I, I had a, a rare thing at, uh, in Ann Arbor before a student, which was a driving permit. And you had to be, as I recall, 28 years old, uh, married, a distinguished war veteran, have a physical disability, and a letter from the president. <laughs> and permission from your mother and whatever in order to have a driving permit. They were very unusual. And at the Daily, we had a couple. And my roommate, Jim Dygert, had one and I had one. And so I could have a car, which was really, driving permit was one that we did actually have a car. And I had a 48 Chevy Coupe, and then I had a 50 uh, Plymouth. And uh, I was working, as most of us do, meal jobs. Uh, I worked at a place that called Red's Right Spot, 14-stool diner that both you guys ate at more than once, I'm sure. But uh, through a long series of misadventures which are recorded in this book here, I think I call that chapter something about pizza. Let's see if I can get the name of it here. Uh, and this was 1956 and 7. 
Yeah, what do I call it? Go oh, cooking up free delivery. Clever, eh? <laughs> but in 19, uh, and I'll give you give away the story here at the, at the end of it. Uh, I because I had this car and this little restaurant that I was helping to to found was uh, seven miles outside of town in Dixborough. And so we were making pizza, but there was nobody to buy it. <laughs> Dixboro, did anybody know where Dixboro is, the little wide spot in the town? Yeah. They don't even have a stoplight, except the one where Ford Road ends at Plymouth Road. There's a stoplight there. But we had a restaurant called Pizza from the Prop. And uh, the only way it got from the prop was my little uh, 48 Chevy and then the 50 Plymouth. So we started free pizza delivery simply because it seemed kind of stupid to have a pizza restaurant out in the middle of nowhere and all those 18 to 20,000 students in Ann Arbor who at 10 o'clock at night their stomachs were growling for pizza. Of course the first pizzas we got there in December and January were like <laughs> bricks of ice and nobody had a microwave then so we had to find a way around that which we did. I'll save that for you to read in the book if you want. But I started that in 1956. Uh, Jim Gilmore owned the restaurant, and I've got a dollar and a half an hour for my brilliant billion dollar idea of delivering free pizza. But I was glad to get it, and I had all the pizza I could eat too, I got that. And my beautiful wife, Marcy, who couldn't be here this evening, uh, we were just getting ready to get engaged then, as I recall. And I used to make pizzas, and Jim Owens, my roommate, would deliver them. And I would uh, cleverly cut these for, she was a Chi Omega sorority girl, and I would cut these pizzas in the shape of a heart. And then I would very artistically put it like a hamburger arrow, you know, through the thing. Isn't that cute? <laughs> okay. And then I would write these mushy things on the cardboard, you know, so she could discover these these uh, priceless uh, poems of love, you know, as she was eating her pizza. Those are the good old days. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, a couple of years after I left, this thing grew and grew and grew, obviously. Anybody that orders a pizza uh, now, the delivery, uh, if you traced its origins back, it would be to that uh, little restaurant in Dixboro, Michigan, and my 48 Chevy and my 50 Plymouth. The Haley's Green Comet, they called it. <laughs> so. Anyhow, any other questions? Comments? Yes. I was Go surprised ahead. to see my cousin, um, Ronnie Donovan, in, in your book. And he's the Haglin, you call Haglin. Dwayne Haglin, Hags. We called him Hags, yeah. Uh, he was our neighbor, and Ronnie lived right next door to us. That was down closer to 15 Mile, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, no, Rochester and 15. Rochester and 15, yeah. That, then just down past that, south of that, where Silver Moon Bar used to be, across the way was that, and I think the house is still there, that brick, red brick house. And there's a story about that. That was Mrs. Freddie Campbell's grandmother, and they had chicken coops out in the back, yeah. And uh, she had a brand new. Uh, 1948 then Hudson, which was a wonderful car, and she had all of four or five hundred miles on that car before we ruined it. <laughs> so, so we were responsible for getting a lot of business referred to C.F. Long. You didn't know where C.F. Long? That was the junkyard. Now, where I'll never forget, you could buy a bushel basket full of hood ornaments then for five dollars. For, there'd be 40 or 50 of them in there. Imagine what that would be worth now. They don't make hood ornaments like that anymore. In fact, they don't make hood ornaments no. anymore. They don't make bushel baskets anymore. Yes. Yeah, they don't make those either. They don't make bushel baskets, he said. Right. Yes. You were talking about the football when your school started. Yes. And I don't remember which year, I graduated in 53, and must have been towards the end of it. Our football team, which was a terrible team and lost almost all its games, was to play an away game. And the rumor ran around the school, oh, they're going to play it. These 
hooligans over there that they're going to play against. It was Troy. Ah, yeah. I'm sure yeah. we yeah. lost it. Yeah. We were team, Thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> I was on that team. That's that was on school. Yes. That's, you're right. That's true. Rainy. Bill Borden. Bill Borden. He held the entire museum staff um, in hysterics for about 10 minutes as he read the passage on your book. Sort of a coming of age, of, I think, a story. When you were working for Mr. Rankin, who you mentioned a number of times. Oh, yeah. And, and his sort of enlightening you on, on the ways of women's biology. <laughs> would, yeah. would you just enlighten us through for a moment, sir? Wow. Well, that was um, no. That's okay. No, I. It, it's that was a one of these. Uh, what do they call tipping point moments in one's life? I, I was my first job was when I was nine years old, helping Floyd Rankin, whose name was Floyd, but we we called him Mike. And uh, he was a janitor at the school, and I started working for him for twenty-five cents an hour. Worked for him for four years, and after the second year, I got a raise to 35 cents an hour, and uh, then was also caddying and setting pins and picking strawberries and whatever you could do, I was doing it. But Mike was uh, a mentor in many ways. In fact, the teachers would come down to ask Mike questions about things they should have known about. And I asked Mike, where did you learn all these things? He said. Crossword puzzles, <laughs> and he did. He learned, and he he would do a crossword puzzle, and he could if he didn't know the answer, he got eventually he could do a crossword puzzle in about five minutes. It was it was incredible, and Mike carried around in him and his in his overalls a lot of change. He had all these keys. He had like three or four hundred keys on a big ring, and you would always hear him jingling as he came down the hall with all this change and these keys. And I always wondered why he carried all these nickels. And I would see occasionally during the day a girl would go up to Mike and say something to him. And then he would give her a nickel and she would go away. And then sometimes a girl would come up and give Mike a nickel and smile and thank him. I, what this? And I would say, Mike, what's that about with those nickels? He says, you know, well, I'll ask your father. Ask my father what? Well, it has to do with girls. I, like I was going to ask my father anything, especially if something had to do with girls. <laughs> and so I'm working and I'm working away, and, and, and one of the, the areas that I cleaned was the girls' restroom. And I'm in there cleaning and sweeping and doing the mirrors and cleaning stuff. And I looked over there, and there was a candy bar machine. <laughs> So I reached in my pocket and I put a nickel in and this candy bar came down and I grabbed and I was thinking it would be like a Whiz or a Powerhouse or a Clark bar or one of those great candy. This thing was just it was white paper. <laughs> so I and it was light, it was one can't be much chocolate in that. And I put I put it in my pocket and I went back and I was gonna have that later, you know. And so I'm sweeping, and we're in, remember the auditorium, which was the one big uh, room that we did have, and where we had had the dances. Yeah. And we were in there, and I was sweeping away, and I bent over to pick up something, and Mike said, Bill, what's that in your back pocket? And, he, and I said, oh, this, and I held it out. He says, yeah, what do you got that for? And I says, well, I, I bought it in the candy machine in the girl's bathroom. He said, the what? I said, the, candy machine, I'm going to have it later. He said, well, I guess there's no accounting for people's tastes. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He says, you better talk to your father. I said, you asked me, you told me that once before. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And uh, I don't know when I finally figured it out. I think it was by the second bite, I think I knew. <laughs> But the whole story is in there, so you got to read the book. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thank you so much for, for coming out and for being here and for listening and uh, for caring about 
uh, the way it was, or the way it was at least for some of us, in Troy and Big Beaver, uh, well, what, 50, 60 years ago? Anyhow, thank you very much.